Chapter Four, Part Two of *The Girl on the Boat* by P. G. Woodhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sam clicks, Part Two. Sam opened the book very willingly. Infernal Bream Mortimer had absolutely shot to pieces the spell which had begun to fall on them at the beginning of their conversation. Only by reading poetry, it seemed to him, could it be recovered. And when he saw the passage at which the volume had opened, he realized that his luck was in. Good old Tennyson! He was all right. He had the stuff. You could rely on him every time. He cleared his throat. Oh, let the solid ground not fail beneath my feet before my life has found what some have found so sweet. Then let come what come may. What matter if I go mad? I shall have had my day. Let the sweet heavens endure, not close and darken above me, before I am quite, quite sure that there is one to love me. This was absolutely topping. It was like diving off a springboard. He could see the girl sitting with a soft smile on her face, her eyes big and dreamy, gazing out over the sunlit sea. He laid down the book and took her hand. There is something, he began in a low voice, which I have been trying to say ever since we met. Something which I think you must have read in my eyes. Her head was bent. She did not withdraw her hand. Until this voyage began, he went on, I did not know what life meant, and then I saw you. It was like the gate of heaven opening. You are the dearest girl I ever met, and you can bet I'll never forget. He stopped. I'm not trying to make it rhyme, he said apologetically. Billy, don't think me silly. I mean, If you had the merest notion, dearest, I don't know what's the matter with me. Billy, darling, you are the only girl in the world. I have been looking for you for years and years, and I have found you at last, my soul mate. Surely this does not come as a surprise to you. That is, I mean, you must have seen that I've been keen. There's that damned Walt Mason stuff again. His eyes fell on the volume beside him, and he uttered an exclamation of enlightenment. It's those poems, he cried. I've been boning them up to such an extent that they've got me doing it too. What I'm trying to say is, will you marry me? She was drooping towards him. Her face was very sweet and tender, her eyes misty. He slid an arm about her waist. She raised her lips to his. Three. Suddenly she drew herself away, a cloud on her face. Darling, she said, I've a confession to make. A confession? You? Nonsense. I can't get rid of a horrible thought. I was wondering if this will last. Our love? Don't be afraid that it will fade. I mean, why, it's so vast, it's bound to last. That is to say, of course it will. She traced a pattern on the deck with her shoe. I'm afraid of myself. You see, once before, and it was not so very long ago, I thought I had met my ideal, but. Sam laughed heartily. Are you worrying about that absurd business of poor old Eustace Hignett? She started violently. You know? Of course, he told me himself. Do you know him? Where did you meet him? I've known him all my life. He's my cousin. As a matter of fact, we are sharing a stateroom on board now. Eustace is on board? Oh, this is awful. What shall I do when I meet him? Oh, just pass it off with a light laugh and a genial quip. Just say, Oh, here you are, or something. You know the sort of thing. It will be terrible. Not a bit of it. Why should you feel embarrassed? He must have realized by now that you acted in the only possible way. It was absurd his ever expecting you to marry him. I mean to say, just look at it dispassionately. Eustace, poor old Eustace, and you, the princess and the swineherd. Does Mr. Hignett keep pigs? she asked, surprised. I mean that poor old Eustace is so far below you, darling, that, with the most charitable intentions, one can only look on his asking you to marry him in the light of a record exhibition of pure nerve. A dear good fellow, of course, but hopeless where the sterner realities of life are concerned. A man who can't even stop a dog fight. In a world which is practically one seething mass of fighting dogs, how could you trust yourself to such a one? Nobody is fonder of Eustace Hignett than I am, but, well, I mean to say. I see what you mean. He really wasn't my ideal. Not by a mile. She mused, her chin in her hand. 
"'Of course he was quite a dear in a lot of ways.' "'Oh, a splendid chap,' said Sam tolerantly. "'Have you ever heard him sing? "'I think what first attracted me to him was his beautiful voice. "'He really sings extraordinarily well.' "'A slight but definite spasm of jealousy afflicted Sam. "'He had no objection to praising poor old Eustace within decent limits, "'but the conversation seemed to him to be confining itself too exclusively to one subject. "'Yes,' he said, "'Oh, yes, I've heard him sing. Not lately. He does drawing-room ballads and all that sort of thing still, I suppose.' "'Have you ever heard him sing, "'My love is like a glowing tulip that in an old-world garden grows?' "'I have not had that advantage,' replied Sam stiffly. "'But any one can sing a drawing-room ballad. Now something funny, something that will make people laugh, something that really needs putting across. That's a different thing altogether.' "'Do you sing that sort of thing?' "'People have been good enough to say.' "'Then,' said Billy decidedly, "'you must certainly do something at the ship's concert to-morrow. "'The idea of your trying to hide your light under a bushel. "'I will tell Bream to count on you. "'He is an excellent accompanist. "'He can accompany you.' "'Yes, but, well, I don't know,' said Sam doubtfully. He could not help remembering that the last time he had sung in public had been at a house supper at school, seven years before, and that on that occasion somebody, whom it was a lasting grief to him that he had been unable to identify, had thrown a pat of butter at him. "'Of course you must sing,' said Billy. "'I'll tell Bream when I go down to lunch. What will you sing?' "'Well, er—' "'Well, I'm sure it will be wonderful, whatever it is. "'You are so wonderful in every way. "'You remind me of one of the heroes of old.' "'Sam's discomposure vanished. "'In the first place, this was much more the sort of conversation "'which he felt the situation indicated. "'In the second place, he had remembered "'that there was no need for him to sing at all. "'He could do that imitation of Frank Tinney, "'which had been such a hit at the Trinity Smoker. "'He was on safe ground there. "'He knew he was good.' He clasped the girl to him, and kissed her sixteen times. 4. Billy Bennett stood in front of the mirror in her stateroom, dreamily brushing the glorious red hair that fell in a tumbled mass about her shoulders. On the lounge beside her, swathed in a business-like grey kimono, Jane Hubbard watched her, smoking a cigarette. Jane Hubbard was a splendid specimen of bronzed, strapping womanhood. Her whole appearance spoke of the open air and the great wide spaces and all that sort of thing. She was a thoroughly wholesome, manly girl, about the same age as Billy, with a strong chin and an eye that had looked leopards squarely in the face and caused them to withdraw abashed into the undergrowth, or wherever it is that leopards withdraw when abashed. One could not picture Jane Hubbard flirting lightly at garden parties, but one could picture her very readily arguing with a mutinous native bearer, or with a firm touch putting sweetness and light into the soul of a refractory mule. Bodica in her girlhood must have been rather like Jane Hubbard. She smoked contentedly. She had rolled her cigarette herself with one hand, a feat beyond the powers of all but the very greatest. She was pleasantly tired after walking eighty-five times round the promenade deck. Soon she would go to bed and fall asleep the moment her head touched the pillow. But meanwhile she lingered here, for she felt that Billy had something to confide in her. "'Jane,' said Billy, "'have you ever been in love?' Jane Hubbard knocked the ash off her cigarette. "'Not since I was eleven, she said in her deep musical voice. "'He was my music master. He was forty-seven and completely bald, but there was an appealing weakness in him which won my heart.' He was afraid of cats, I remember. Billy gathered her hair into a molten bundle and let it run through her fingers. "'Oh, Jane!' she exclaimed. "'Surely you don't like weak men. I like a man who is strong and brave and wonderful.' "'I can't stand brave men,' said Jane. "'It makes them so independent. I could only love a man who would depend on me in everything. Sometimes, when I have been roughing it out in the jungle,' she went on rather wistfully, "'I have had my dreams of some gentle, clinging man "'who would put his hand in mine "'and tell me all his poor little troubles "'and let me pet and comfort him "'and bring the smiles back to his face. "'I'm beginning to want to settle down. "'After all, there are other things "'for a woman to do in this life "'besides travelling and big game hunting. 
I should like to go into Parliament. And, if I did that, I should practically have to marry. I mean, I should have to have a man to look after the social end of life, and arrange parties and receptions and so on, and sit ornamentally at the head of my table. I can't imagine anything jollier than marriage under conditions like that. When I came back a bit done up after a long sitting at the house, he would mix me a whisky and soda, and read poetry to me, or prattle about all the things he had been doing during the day. Why, it would be ideal! Jane Hubbard gave a little sigh. Her fine eyes gazed dreamily at a smoke ring, which she had sent floating towards the ceiling. Jane, said Billy, I believe you are thinking of somebody definite. Who is he? The big game huntress blushed. The embarrassment which she exhibited made her look manlier than ever. I don't know his name. But there is really someone? Yes. How splendid! Tell me about him. Jane Hubbard clasped her strong hands and looked down at the floor. "'I met him on the subway a couple of days before I left New York. You know how crowded the subway is at the rush hour. I had a seat, of course, but this poor little fellow—so good-looking, my dear, he reminded me of the pictures of Lord Byron—was hanging from a strap and being jerked about till I thought his poor little arms would be wrenched out of their sockets. And he looked so unhappy, as though he had some secret sorrow.' I offered him my seat, but he wouldn't take it. A couple of stations later, however, the man next to me got out, and he sat down, and we got into conversation. There wasn't time to talk much. I told him I had been downtown fetching an elephant gun, which I had left to be mended. He was so prettily interested when I showed him the mechanism. We got along famously. But, oh, well, it was just another case of ships that pass in the night. I'm afraid I've been boring you." "'Oh, Jane, you haven't. You see, you see, I'm in love myself.' "'I had an idea you were,' said her friend, looking at her critically. "'You've been refusing your oats the last few days, and that's a sure sign. "'Is he that fellow that's always around with you, and who looks like a parrot?' "'Bream Mortimer? Good gracious no!' cried Billy indignantly. "'As if I should fall in love with Bream.' "'When I was out in British East Africa,' said Miss Hubbard, I had a bird that was the living image of Bream Mortimer. I taught him to whistle Annie Laurie, and to ask for his supper in three native dialects. Eventually he died of the pip, poor fellow. Well, if it isn't Bream Mortimer, who is it? His name is Marlow. He's tall and handsome and very strong-looking. He reminds me of a Greek god. Ugh, said Miss Hubbard. Jane, we're engaged. "'No,' said the huntress, interested. "'When can I meet him?' "'I'll introduce you to-morrow. I'm so happy.' "'That's fine.' "'And yet, somehow,' said Billy, plaiting her hair, "'do you ever have presentiments? I can't get rid of an awful feeling that something's going to happen to spoil everything.' "'What could spoil everything?' "'Well, I think him so wonderful, you know. Suppose he were to do anything to blur the image I have formed of him.' "'Oh, he won't. You said he was one of those strong men, didn't you? They always run true to form. They never do anything except be strong.' Billy looked meditatively at her reflection in the glass. "'You know, I thought I was in love once before, Jane.' "'Yes?' "'We were going to be married, and I had actually gone to the church, and I waited and waited, and he didn't come. And what do you think had happened?' "'What?' "'His mother had stolen his trousers.' Jane Hubbard laughed heartily. "'It's nothing to laugh at,' said Billy, seriously. "'It was a tragedy. I had always thought him romantic, and when this happened the scales seemed to fall from my eyes. I saw that I had made a mistake.' "'And you broke off the engagement?' "'Of course.' "'I think you were hard on him. A man can't help his mother stealing his trousers.' "'No, but when he finds they're gone, he can phone to the tailor for some more, or borrow the janitor's, or do something. But he simply stayed where he was, and didn't do a thing. Just because he was too much afraid of his mother to tell her straight out that he meant to be married that day.' "'Now that,' said Miss Hubbard, "'is just the sort of trait in a man which would appeal to me. I like a nervous, shrinking man.' "'I don't. Besides, it made him seem so ridiculous, and, I don't know why it is, I can't forgive a man for looking ridiculous. Thank goodness my darling Sam couldn't look ridiculous, even if he tried. 
"'He's wonderful, Jane. "'He reminds me of a knight of the round table. "'You ought to see his eyes flash.' "'Miss Hubbard got up and stretched herself with a yawn. "'Well, I'll be on the promenade deck after breakfast tomorrow. "'If you can arrange to have him flash his eyes then, "'say between nine-thirty and ten, "'I shall be delighted to watch them.'" End of Chapter 4, Part 2 Read by Kara Schallenberg in June 2011 in San Diego, California.